we are in existence, many of us, and we still are calling upon several others who share with us the same dream to be in existence. And we are in our hundreds, so much so that we now have a federation of small, medium enterprises of Uganda, which federation is headed by an executive director, Mr. John Walugembe. John is with us in the room. Having heard what we can do, what we should do, how we should do it, the enabling environment for us to do it, the guarantees from government, the challenges from the banks and financiers and everyone in between. I think it's only fair that now we get to listen from ourselves, the SMEs, speaking about our role in the oil and gas sector. And so, John, I have the pleasure to invite you to step forward on this dice and speak to your fellow entrepreneurs and tell them about their roles, hedging and banking on what has been spoken to us by the bigger folks in the room. I welcome you, sir. Good morning. There's no energy in the room. When they asked me, should you speak before break, break after, I said after, because I suspected the energy levels might be low. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, our partners, Stand Back and Better. The Federation of SMEs has a long-term partnership with the Stand Back Incubator. And I'm really pleased that this is not an agreement in words, but it's a real tangible agreement through which we are working together to ensure that the issues that affect the SME sector are prioritized and they are addressed. I also want to thank the UNOC for putting some resources on the table. Please give them a hand clap. We want to thank the Ministry of Energy. I think the PS has left, but uh, please convey my thanks to her. She gave a comprehensive speech around how the ministry and government in general seeks to support uh, the SME sector, take advantage of the opportunities in the oil and gas sector. Now, before I, I go into the substantive details, now that I have this platform, allow me to convey my, uh, uh, my condolences to the people who lost uh, their lives and those who were hurt through the, recent, uh, through the recent attacks. The fact that we are having this conference, I think, is a good thing because it shows that we cannot be scared by these hooligans. Whatever, they, <laughs> whatever their, their objectives are, we need to go on with life and we need to show them that this economy will keep standing. So let's keep in prayers those people who are going through a difficult time as a result of those issues. I'll start by talking about the Federation of SMEs. I'll talk about SMEs in general. I'll paint a picture for you so that we are able to understand. When we're talking about SMEs, who we might be referring to, and then I'll take a deep dive into the specific opportunities in the oil and gas sector. Now, the Federation is the umbrella body for all micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. We represent close to 734,000 SMEs in Uganda. But this is low. We, are, we should be representing about three or four million SMEs. So there's a lot of work that we need to do to ensure that every SME in this country, we know where they are and we can locate them. And we are working towards that to ensure that if you want an SME in Karamoja, we can give you their actual address and you can go and meet them there. As a federation, we stick to ensure that the interests of SMEs are taken care of by whoever, because SMEs are the backbone to the growth of this country. If we don't have small businesses, colleagues, we are going to struggle. All these countries that we see, China, India, Malaysia, they have grown because they have placed a lot of emphasis on supporting homegrown businesses. Obviously, homegrown businesses have weaknesses, and that's why 
that partnership with foreign investors is critical. A valuable partnership, a partnership that ensures that there is skills transfer, a partnership that ensures that there is transfer of know-how, a, tra a partnership that ensures that there is transfer of technology. When China opened up in the 1970s, it started an experiment in a few towns where it allowed market-based policies to be, you know, some form of experimentation by allowing in a few farms from abroad to come. They were simply trying to learn from Singapore what Singapore had done before to see can it be replicated in the Chinese context, and it worked. Now, the beauty with history is that by studying it very closely, we can replicate it. Recently, there was an innovation forum, and I'm sorry for raising this issue. There was an innovation forum. Now, mind you, globally, we are talking about autonomous cars, isn't it? Cars that can drive themselves, and they have been, I would say they're about 90% accurate now. Eh? Then, uh, on, on our innovation forum, I saw cars made of metal. I, I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad idea to innovate, but let us not waste time trying to undo things that have been done, isn't it? The cars that we are, trying, we are innovating here, we are innovated in 19, what, 32, 33? Now, why, why, why are we trying to re redo the wheel? Eh? Let us be like our Chinese colleagues. Our Chinese colleagues, actually, if there's any country we can learn from, in my opinion, it is China. Because the Chinese and the Asians in general have the same, we, we share a lot. Eh? We tend to be very communal societies. Two, we tend to be very respectful of authority. Three, we tend to work for the, we are less individualistic. But colleagues in the 70s in China, you would have very few cars. In Beijing, maybe you would have 40 cars. The bulk of the population were driving motorcycles. Now China has the second biggest number of per capita billionaires in the world. We must learn from them. So that collaboration between local SMEs and foreign-based investors is very critical. In the Chinese case, they made sure that they protect the interests of their businesses to ensure that that passes. Our Chinese friends would go to a Mercedes-Benz factory, they buy two units, one for driving, one for reverse engineering. They work backwards. Then you see a car, it looks like a Benz. Everything is like a Benz. But the name is Bent. Okay? And they are offering it to us Africans at a quarter of the price. And therefore, we buy. Because for us, we don't care whether it's Benz or Bent. So long as it appears to be one, we shall buy and use it. So SMEs, therefore, are critical. Now, when China has risen, because now China is rising, our colleagues have started to get scared. Hmm? You hear issues of intellectual property, you hear issues of what? They've cut off sources for microchips to, chi to China and so on. The Chinese have already built capacity, it's too late. It is closing the gate when the horse has bolted, you understand? You are saying, I don't want the host to bolt, but it went in the morning, and you are closing at 11 a.m. So as Ugandans and as Africans, we must build our capacity, starting from our local SMEs. These investors that come in, let us use them to build strong and viable relationships that will benefit both of us. They want to make money. We also want to make money. But they are not NGOs. Total is not going to think for you, it can help you, but you have to think for yourself and say, can you help me? Sometimes they even go out of their way 
like Total is doing, like Sandbeck is doing, they use their own resources to, to even look and say, what, how can we even help you to go further? In our mother tongue, we say, when you see someone crying on your behalf, you even cry? Moa, Stanbik, Mr. Otowa, you're representing Stanbik, and I'm sorry for putting you on the spot. You're investing a lot of resources, moving around the country. They keep calling me, John, we have trained so many SMEs here. Can you please come and give a speech? We have trained so many SMEs here. Can you? We need to do more. We need to do more to ensure that we build our local entrepreneurial base. We have a problem, members, of youth unemployment. You know, we can sit here. This is an air-conditioned office. We are all educated. Right? It's not an office, actually. It's a hall. Sorry. It's a hall. It's air-conditioned. We are all educated. We are smart. We are talking about oil and gas. But in this country, there are people who feel excluded. They feel that there is no opportunity for them. Even when the opportunity is, even when the opportunity is, when I left, and I keep telling this story, when I left business school in the UK, they gave me residence. Hmm? They gave me residence. I started the company. They had a lot of money, by the way. You just go to the council, then you say, we want to do a business plan, then they give you like 30,000 pounds. Can you imagine? Then you, you get some money, they, they have a UK innovation, something, you apply for $100,000, and then they give you. Now, most of our Africans stayed behind. Stayed behind. It is lucrative because that is easy money. You don't work, you don't sweat like in Kampala. You have to call someone, go, sente zange ziri wa, eh, 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 mobile man nga simulaba, eh. The other one is easy money. For me, I said, let me go back. But our friends in the way, my colleagues, the, the colleagues who are within business school who are from other backgrounds, were asking me how to come and set up business in Uganda all the time. They were interviewing me, what opportunities are in Uganda, blah, blah, blah. Someone set up a private equity fund here, was asking me this. So there is a problem. Africans are in a rush to get out. The people outside are in a rush to get. In economics, we say maybe there is information asymmetry. Something is not right. Either we are blind to the opportunities that surround us, and we need to be educated. Or there is genuinely a problem in our country. But my view is no. In 2010, I took a delegation of business people to Germany. One of them, I was an employee. And that's when I said, I'm going to leave employment. Because I saw really it was, sorry to say, it was almost a scam. We went, I had my per diem, we had signed for it. I thought I was really rich. So we went to Germany and so on. Every time we would eat, this colleague would say, John, just eat, don't worry. You brought us here, there's no need for you to pay. He had the card, he would swipe. Shh. Next place, he swipes. Next place, like that, for two weeks. I never spent money, I just went and shopped, new suits, what? Then I sat down and asked him, Mr. X, what is the issue? He told me, me, at that point he was 31. He told me, me, I left India eight years ago. When I was leaving India, I went to a local priest because I had two opportunities. I had an opportunity in Uganda, I had an opportunity in Dubai. And I asked the local priest, where should I go? The local priest told me, go to Uganda. So he told me, personally, I wanted to go to Dubai, but the priest told me, go to where? So he came here, he started working in an oil processing factory in Kawempe. He set up his factory. He set up now LPG gas. He has an LPG gas factory now in old Kampala here. And he has a hardware store on Chagwe Road. He's a rich man. He's in his 40s now, but he's very rich. 
So I looked at this man and he told me, he, so he paid an air ticket for his priest to come and said, John, you come and see my priest who gave me good advice. I said, I'm busy today. <laughs> so the, as you are talking about oil and gas, I'm sorry some of you may think I'm deviating. I'm off point, not off point. Our country has a lot of opportunities. In the oil and gas alone, $200 billion. That's a lot of money. For me, when I left university, I never touched one million shillings. In my first job, I went. The guy gave me a checkbook, said, go and withdraw money. It was eight million. When they gave me the money, I started sweating. When I was walking, I kept on looking in all directions. I felt that everyone was seeing the money in my pocket. Two hundred billion. It's a lot of money, but now. And if we are not serious, other people can take those opportunities from. Because this is a capitalistic world. We are not. No one is here to help us. We have to help ourselves. Now, we are talking about SMEs. Ah, sorry, Mr. MC. Please keep reminding me because I can just talk as if I'm in a church. Just keep reminding me so that I can stay within my time. We are talking about SMEs. Which SMEs are we talking about? In Uganda, 93% of all SMEs are micro. Micro means in a year they make less than 10 million shillings. Micro means they employ less than four people, but most of them are self-employed. Micro means most of them are not registered. Micro means most of them are operating for survival. We have about 5% who are small and about 3% who are medium. Now, when I look at the requirements, because I have a company, I'm also smart. I'm a businessman. When I saw oil and gas, I registered the company. Then we went to register on the, on the petroli, National Petroleum yeah, Database. Eh? Then they say, but for you to register, you must have tax what? But you have just started, are you seeing? Huh? You have just registered, but you need tax what? Yeah. Eh. Then you go to URA, hey, I've just started, but give me tax. Which is not easy, it's not as easy as we say these things. Those of you who run businesses, you know Am I deceiving? Hey, you can put nine requirements, but my friend, meeting the nine, for us, we bid for work. You put everything. You put all the documentation, previous work, what? You find that there is one thing remaining called tax clearance. You put in the system. The deadline is at midday, you wait. The system sends you a message, acknowledgement. You wait for the system. You cannot call the system to say I'm late. You wonder who is behind the system to call. When you call landline, they say, don't worry. Did you put in the system? Yes, wait. You wait. I applied for tax clearance three weeks ago. It came two weeks, eh? it came yesterday. We are pleased to inform you that your tax clearance is here. After two weeks, deadline passed. So these are issues we must also resolve to assist our SMEs. Therefore, let's make the process, in my view, easier. Number two, let's make it, let's handhold our businesses. What the stand making incubator is doing is excellent. And we need to, act to, 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 to what, what can I say? We need to appreciate them for what they are doing. But we need to do more. A lot of SMEs are not aware. Every time they think about oil and gas, they think about someone putting on an oil with the oil around their what? In an oil rig. Say, ah, no, 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 I, I have nothing to do there. We need to tell them opportunity. 16 sectors reserved for you. $200 billion which you can take advantage of. And then let's handhold them to ensure that they take advantage of those opportunities. Finally, Recently, there was a meeting in Scotland, COP24, where our colleagues were talking about, I have five minutes, good. They were talking about greening and things like that. Have you heard of that thing? Eh? 
You haven't. There was a COP23 climate change conference in Scotland. Now, I want to warn you. Our colleagues, their industries and their success has been built on coal, oil and gas, and they have become rich, isn't it? After they have become rich, they have said, now God has spoken to us. We need to go green. We need to use wind. We need to use the solar. As if wind can run a what? A factory. Eh? So, it's good to follow this agenda, but let's concentrate on taking advantage of opportunities in the oil and gas. And the president wrote a nice op opinion in the New York Times saying exactly this. As Africans, let's try to create an energy mix that works for us. And for Uganda, the opportunities in the oil and gas sector are immense. And let us not feel guilty about leveraging them. Thank you very much.